My name is Charles Lego, and I'm the executive director of the California Capital Documentary Film Festival that will take place right here in Rancho Cordova, Sacramento on June 10, 11, and 12. We're very excited for this event as it's the first documentary film festival in the Sacramento region. We will have three screens over three days with 60 films. Over the, over the next few weeks, I'm going to be doing interviews with some of the more notable filmmakers and subjects of the documentaries to introduce to you who we will be showing and hopefully get everybody excited about the festival. Today, I'm very happy to have our first interview for one of the films that we're going to be showing. And that's David Mirisch, who needs very little introduction because I'm gonna let him tell us all about himself. But suffice to say, he's a Hollywood legend. He's worked with every star, music star that you can imagine. And without further ado, David, how are you? Good, and thank you for having me kick off this wonderful series. Well, tell us, tell us about your family. They're very uh, notable in Hollywood. Um, so just tell us, tell us a little bit about your family and the films that they produced, and then we'll go from there. Real quickly, the uh, four Marish brothers came to New York. Uh, their father, Max, was born in Krakow, Poland. And while they were in New York, they got into the theater business, actually managing theaters. So um, my dad and my mother, uh, we moved to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, or they did, where I was born in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And then all four brothers moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where they opened Theater Candy Company. And uh, that was a business that supplied popcorn and candy to a thousand movie theaters throughout the Midwest. And then after a few years, three of the brothers, the oldest, Marvin, Harold, and Walter, said, we're going to go to Hollywood. So they went to work for an uh, old studio that a lot of your viewers will remember. It was called Monogram Pictures. And while they were at Monogram Pictures, they worked uh, with Johnny Mac Brown. They produced a lot of Westerns, Baba the Jungle Boy. And then when they were there, it, they changed the name to Allied Artists. And while uh, under the banner of Allied Artists, they made Moby Dick, the original one with Gregory Peck. Um, but, you know, they, they did those films and then they decided that they were going to go on their own. And that's when they formed the Mirage Corporation. And from that day, they produced 72 motion pictures. They've won 24 Academy Awards and uh, three Oscars for best picture. And including, you know, the films they did that everybody loves, you know, was West Side Story, Filler on the Roof, The Great Escape, The Magnificent Seven, and the film that was voted the number one comedy of all time, some like it hot with Marilyn Monroe and Tony Curtis. So it's safe to say that your family for sure produced and worked on the most iconic movies in the early years of Hollywood for sure. Yeah, so David, and they never they never produced an X-rated film. Of the 72 films they did, there was never an X-rated film. And their philosophy was go hire the director and the director can get any star that they wanted to work for them. So that's when they hired Billy Wilder, William Wyler, John Sturgis, uh, Fred Zinneman, you know, all those great directors. And they were able, you know, to get Marilyn Monroe and all those big stars to work for them, Shirley MacLaine, all of them. So that was their philosophy. Sign the director up and the director will bring the stars in. Right. And timeless films, because those films are still seen today. So, so David, tell us, where were you born? I was born in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, on, a, on the Gettysburg battlefield. And we lived there five years. And then we moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I was raised in Milwaukee. I went to 
Shorewood High School. I went to Ripon College, you know, and uh, so my roots were as a Wisconsin Badger until my dad and mom and I, we moved to California when I was, I think, about 20, 21 years old, yeah. So how did you, how did your Hollywood career start? How did you get into the entertainment Well, business? when I um, was in Milwaukee, I was working for United Artists Pictures, which the Marriage Corporation distributed all of their films through. And I was a uh, PR man. So I worked for a year on the road, opening lots of movies that, um, you know, United Artists released. And then um, one day I said, you know, I've had enough of this. And I uh, started working in the uh, private public relations field. And I was able to get a job under the best PR man that Hollywood has ever seen, a man by the name of Henry Rogers. And he owned a company called Rogers and Cowan. So I sat in his office in the corner and uh, came in every morning at 6 a.m. I had to e have every trade paper read, every newspaper read by the time Mr. Rogers came in. And that's why I still get up at 4 a.m. today. <laughs> so you didn't get into the family business. Um, why, no, why no, was none, that? none of the sons did. The fathers did not want them on the sets because they felt if Steve McQueen wanted to make a comment and one of us was there that we'd probably tell it to our fathers. So none of the boys of any of the four brothers uh, ever worked on a set. They became, you know, uh, assistant directors, you know, for other films. They got into the video business. They, one became a lawyer. I became a Hollywood press agent but none of us ever worked directly on a mirrorish film. And you went on to represent some of the biggest names in Hollywood and music. Uh, you discovered Farrah Fawcett at 16. Tell us a little about that. How did that come about that you came to well, represent? Well, I, I was representing some of the most beautiful uh, women in Hollywood at the time. Linda Carter, you know, who was Wonder Woman. Um, Lindsay Wagner, who was the bionic woman, Barbara Eden, who was on I Dream of Jeannie, Barbara Parkins, who was on Peyton Place. So the University of Texas knew, um, you know, that I handled all these beautiful actresses. So they said, would you be a judge for us to find the prettiest girl on our University of Texas campus? And I said, sure. So they sent me all the pictures and there was this one gal that stood out. And I just said to them, I'd like to talk to, the, uh, to her parents. So they introduced me to uh, Farrah's parents. And I said, I think your daughter should come to Hollywood. They said, no, nope, we don't want any of that glamour. We don't want to tarnish her. We don't want to, you know, corrupt her. And they said, well, call us in a year. So a year passed by. And then one day they called me and they said, we're ready for Farrah to go to Hollywood. So I checked her into what was then known as the Hollywood Studio Club, where all of the brilliant, young, beautiful actresses from Hollywood stayed. And then uh, my building uh, on Sunset Boulevard was one floor below uh, an agency and I introduced Farrah to Dick Clayton, and Dick Clayton uh, signed her to a agency contract, got her a job at Screen Gems. I did all of her publicity that first year. Then, of course, which is typical of Hollywood, I get a letter a year later saying, thank you for the wonderful job that you've done on Farrah, but it's time for us to move on. So. <laughs> That was the end of my uh, relationship with Farrah. She did mention me in videos. She did mention me, you know, in her autobiography. But, um, you know, that was the end of it. And we never, we bumped into each other a few times after that. But, you know, she never openly said, oh, yeah, David Marish discovered me. 
She did mention it in the video. She did mention it in the biography. But, you know, that's fine with me. You know, I wasn't a glory seeker. And I'm happy that I got the career start of, I think, one of the, you know, most one, brilliant one young yeah. women in Hollywood. For sure. Absolutely. So tell us, uh, just drop, let, let's be, let's name drop. Why don't you name drop some, <laughs> name drop some names of people that you worked with? Closely. Well, um, I had the pleasure, I think, of working with two of the greatest figures in show business. One was Frank Sinatra. I produced a tennis tournament for the Tina Sinatra Youth Center in Palm Desert, California. And Mr. Sinatra spent the day with us and I was his escort there for the entire day. And then I think another icon similar to Mr. Sinatra was John Wayne. Um, I was involved in a uh, charity event called the City of Hope Victor Awards for 28 years. And I was responsible for booking uh, over 500 athletes and Hollywood celebrities to be on this Fox uh, Net telecast. And John Wayne was one of the celebrities I brought up. I picked him up at the airport and I was his host for the evening. And I'll never forget, people came up and said, can I have your autograph? And what he did is he pulled out a little card with his name on it and they said, he said, here's my autograph. And they said, no, I want you to sign it. He said, I just signed it before I came down here. But he was such a humble man. And, you know, and I, and I did the PR for Peter Sellers, which I feel is one of the greatest comedians ever to come out of England. And, you know, I've had the pleasure of really working, you know, with wonderful recording artists. I was the first press agent for Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, Petula Clark from England, you know, so I've been blessed really with a wonderful career. I've represented over 500 actors and entertainers and singers uh, as their press agent, yeah. Wow, that's definitely very, very impressive. You know, um, Hollywood PR is one of the most coveted positions, really, in Hollywood. How did you how did you get all these people? How did you come to represent them? Well, you know, back in the I guess early '60s, you know, you just went out and you look for people, and you know, uh, then the co competition between PR firms was not as great as it is today. So, you know, I was able to go to Lindsay Wagner, Linda Carter. You know, Linda Carter was represented by her husband at the time, Ron Samuels. So I said, can I do her PR? He said, sure, David. You know, so, you know, through the networking of knowing the managers, knowing the agents, I went to them and I was able to build that database of these hundreds and hundreds of actors, entertainers, and celebrities. Very nice. So tell us, tell us a story about one. Just tell us your favorite story about someone iconic. And remember, we're PG rated here. So, so tell us a story, your favorite story. About which one? About anybody, you choose. Uh -huh. Well, I think one of the, the, the most fun was Shaquille O'Neal. I invited him to the Victor Awards and uh, we had to get him a private jet. He was not going to come up to Vegas on commercial flight. So I had to book the jet and then we uh, met him at the airport and he got in the limousine and he sat, sat opposite my wife, Sandy and I. He put these big, big shoes up on our seat and I've never seen a shoe in my life that big you know but i think some of the things that you know i enjoyed the most in my career um i was the get my wife and i were the guest of the uh, queen of denmark i took pat boone and um dion warwick to denmark because they celebrate american independence day july 4th so we were the guest of the queen then i did a golf tournament in bali and we were the guest of the King of Malaysia. You know, so I've had the, the honor and the pleasure to travel around the world. You know, we went to the Galapagos Islands twice. You know, what a thrill that was. And we uh, brought Robin Leach with us and he filmed 
a segment of, you know, the rich and the famous. And we took um, my client and my wife's best friend, Margot Hemingway, and she was the feature, um, you know, uh, actor, actress in that segment of Rich and Famous. So, you know, we've traveled around the world and we were on the first Virgin Airline plane to ever fly from Los Angeles to London because I did a promotion for Virgin. And in return, they gave us two first class tickets on Virgin. Wow. You know, so my life has been so blessed, uh, you know, and I thank God that, you know, I'm still healthy. Uh, going to be 87 uh, in a couple months, and I just feel very blessed. So growing up, did you ever imagine that you would have the life that you ended up having in Hollywood? No, because in Milwaukee, you know, we were in the candy business, and, you know, show business didn't even exist in our minds. And You know, the uncles then went to Hollywood, and then, you know, I didn't grow up in Hollywood because we stayed in Milwaukee, and everybody, you know, later in the years, they said, David, how come you're not, you know, tainted like a lot of the people here? I said, I grew up in the Midwest, and I feel that growing up in the Midwest gave me good values to be a good human being. So you, you're, David, you're very well known for raising money. You've raised over $35 million at charity events, which is certainly an achievement. How did you tell us how you started that? How did that come about? And how well, did you it's get... interesting. It started with a public relations client that if anybody knows the world of tennis, his name was Tony Trabert. You know, he won the U.S. Open, he won Wimbledon. And one day he came to me, he said, David, you know, I just bought a camp in Ojai, California. I want people to know about it. So I said, Tony, why don't we put on a celebrity tennis tournament for charity. And that was the first of 2,500 events that I've been involved in in my career. Very nice. Well, $35 million is a lot of money to raise uh, for charity. So now let's talk about your film, David Merrish, The Man Behind the Golden Stars, which is the film that we are going to be featuring here at the film festival. But before we do that, we're going to just take a quick look at a clip from the film. The question is asked of me which of, of the 72 films that the family produced is my favorite. When you say, Some Like It Hot with Marilyn Monroe and The Great Escape and West Side Story, of course, I don't think I have really any favorite. David's family, obviously, it's from the golden age of what it was like to be a star. That's the reason I became an actor, because of the movie West Side Story. I was involved with the Marishes. I did a film called Midway. I did Pink Panther. They're wonderful, wonderful producers. They stayed behind you all of the way. I built up my client list of actors and actresses and entertainers, and I was handling Johnny Mathis, Perry Como, Sergio Mendez. David has refined the business of creating fun experiences to benefit a cause. He has done so much to help so many people. I'm glad we're doing a story about him because he's always the one doing stories about other people. His own life is a wonderful story in itself. So David, I've seen the film and as I mentioned to you, I was a man, uh, well, I am a manager. I produce films. I've managed, you know, I think you know Cloris Leachman and I've managed people. And watching your film is certainly very inspirational uh, for someone, to, you know, to aspire to, someone who wants to work in Hollywood. Um, how did the film come about? Well, it's very interesting. Um, a young man by the name of Anselmo Martini is also an actor and he did a couple of my events and then one day he and a lady by the name of Marcella Marie's who actually directed the documentary came up to me and they said David we'd like to do a documentary on your life I said what are you kidding they said no I said why me and they very politely said David you've given so much back to the world through your fundraising 
we feel that people should know about it. What do you think people will be most surprised when they watch the film to learn about you? Oh boy, that, that's a question. <laughs> You're the first one that's ever said that. What they would be most surprised? Boy, maybe a, about a guy that was born in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you know, middle class family that somehow found a way not only to be a press agent, but find a way to help all these nonprofits throughout the United States, seven foreign countries. So I think maybe that's the thing that they're going to walk away with, say, you know, gosh, I didn't know anything about him. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I took away from it as someone who works in Hollywood and someone who manages people. I mean, you, you represented them in the PR world, I represent them in the manager world, but it's how much you accomplished and the level of caliber of people that you worked with. I think that in itself is an accomplishment. And I think that's something that comes across very strongly in the film. Well, one, you, of, one of the things I'm proud of that all these events, as you can imagine, I brought hundreds and hundreds of people together that today they are bonding in friendship five, 10, 20, 30 years later because they met at a David Marish tennis tournament, a golf tournament, a ski event, and one couple even got married from meeting at one of my tennis tournaments. So that really, really makes me good because when I go on Facebook and I see everybody posting, I know they're posting because they met through me. So that, right. that is a really wonderful feeling inside of me. So tell me, David, what do you think about Hollywood today compared to, compared to your day? I mean, we just saw an incident where, you know, a very well-known actor in front of the whole world at one of the most legendary event, the most important Hollywood event, gets up, walks onto the stage and slaps the host. Would that have ever happened in your day? No, not in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and, you know, the clients I represented, like Perry Como, Johnny Mathis, Pat Boone, you know, Petula Clark, Omar Sharif, Peter Sellers, these were, you know, down to earth people. They weren't divas, they didn't demand. And today, when I contact a press agent to invite their client to an event that I still do some charity events, I never even hear back from them. In my day, when someone asked for Pat Boone to do an interview, I talked to Pat, then I call the person back and I say yes or no. Today they don't do that. So the entire world from manager to agent, to press agent, to lawyer, to business manager, it's all changed, as you very well know, drastically since the... Right. And that's actually your speaking. You're a man of my heart. Because the one thing that I cannot stand is when you send an email and the person just doesn't reply. I think that is, so, that is very rude. At the very least, they can say, I got your email and I'll write back to you soon. But I understand. I sent 75 invitations out to attend the Kentucky Derby, all expenses paid. I sent 75 emails to press agents. I only heard back from seven. The others, as you said, did not even have the courtesy to say yes or no. And they can easily say no, right? I, in fact, I'd rather people say no. Yeah. And just not say anything. Yeah, but, but they don't do that now. They just say, well, my client can't do it, so I'm not even going to respond. Exactly. And, I hear and the odds are, I, I don't believe that most of my emails are even being seen by the client. I think the press agent today makes that decision sitting at his or her desk and say, oh, he will or he won't do it. So most of the time he won't want to do this, so I won't even reply. No, the right. whole world and, and show business has changed, yeah. I understand. So David, what does a day look like for David Mirish today? Tell us about your day. What time do you get up in the morning? What do you do? Tell us about your day. 
Well, I still get up between four and five in the morning, going way back to the Henry Rogers era. So, you know, when I get up, uh, I usually read the paper from the day before, so I can read that in the morning. I go online, I look at the LA Times, I read that paper, and then I get on my computer, I answer emails, and if I'm working on clients, you know, then I will respond. But the exciting thing in my life is that Sandy and I uh, uh, will be in Costa Rica by the time your film festival airs because we're now making our permanent home in a town called Haco, Costa Rica. And we're going to, we're, we're going to be there, you know, starting on uh, November 4th. Yeah, that's Very that's. Nice. That's the next chapter in our lives. Well, David, I'm very sorry that you can't make it to our festival. I was kind of hoping you could because I, I certainly I would have stuck with you. I have a lot of questions to ask you just personal, you know, personally, I have questions. I think learning from someone like you is invaluable. Um, and I'm and I'm very sorry that you can't make it, but I do understand that we are going to have a couple of members of your family that are going to come to the screening, and we'll do a Q and A, and hopefully you can um, join us via Zoom. No, I'd be happy to. You know, everything is on WhatsApp nowadays, so you know if you decide you would like me to do that, you know, let's set the call up, and I'll be happy to be on Q and A. We will definitely do that. Well, David, that's all we have time for. We're, we're keeping these to, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Um, and again, I know you're going to be off to your beautiful home in Costa Rica. And I definitely thank you very much for your time to join us today. And God bless you and all, all the viewers that hopefully will come to the screens and enjoy those 60 films. So there we have it. I hope everyone will catch uh, David Mirish, Man Behind the Golden Stars, will be screening that during the film festival at our main stage at Rancho Cordova City Hall. And thank you very much for joining us and tune in again when we'll be featuring one of our next films.